Let's take a look at downsizing from an employment law perspective. Downsizing or reduction in force is used to refer to terminations that stem from employers' decisions to operate with fewer or different types of staff. Employers regularly decide to go out of business, close facilities, relocate, restructure, subcontract, adapt new business strategy, sell business units, and merge or acquire other companies. These business decisions typically result in some employees losing their jobs. The law provides employees with very few options for challenging business decisions that result in employment loss. Challenges to downsizing decisions derive primarily from the NLRA, which is implicated in two ways. First, downsizing might lead to unfair labor practice known as a ULP charge if it is deemed to interfere with the exercise of employees' NLRA rights or used to discriminate against employees based on their union activity. Second, employers might have a legal obligation to bargain with union representatives over decisions to downsize and their effects on employees. Relocation of work from one facility to another can also violate the NLRA if motivated by hostility towards unions. The implementation of downsizing decisions is sometimes affected by the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification or WARN Act. Employers covered by the WARN Act are prohibited from ordering plant closings or mass layoffs until the end of a 60-day period that follows a written notice to affected employees and to state and local government officials. Affected employees are those who are reasonably expected to suffer employment loss, including termination, a layoff lasting more than six months, or a reduction in work hours during each month of any six-month period. Other measures that might be used by struggling employers, including cuts in pay or benefits, short-term layoffs, and limited reductions in work hours, do not bring the WARN Act's notification requirements into play. Only relatively large employers are covered by the WARN Act. Specifically, employers are covered if they have 100 or more full-time employees or have 100 or more full and part-time employees working at least 4,000 hours per week. The relevant point in time for determining coverage is generally the date on which the first notice of an impending closing or mass layoff is required to be given, which is 60 days prior to the downsizing. The meanings of the term plant closing and mass layoff are central to the act and not self-evident. Under the WARN Act, a plant closing is a permanent or temporary shutdown of a single site of employment when that shutdown results in employment loss during a 30-day period for at least 50 full-time employees. A mass layoff is a reduction in force that is not caused by a plant closing, but that results in employment loss at a single work site during any 30-day period for at least 500 full-time employees or at least 50 full-time employees. Multiple notifications might be required under the WARN Act, and it contains some rather large loopholes. When decisions must be made as to which employees will be selected for termination, the main legal requirement in this regard is that the means of selecting individuals for downsizing must not be discriminatory. Determining whether a discharge is actually part of a reduction in force is not always straightforward. A workforce reduction situation occurs when business considerations cause an employer to eliminate one or more positions within the company. Determining whether a termination is part of a reduction in force matters because if it is, the fact necessitates a modification of the approach typically used in discriminatory discharge cases. Courts accept the general legitimacy of downsizing and the likelihood that many of those who are downsized will be older than age 40 simply because this group makes up a larger proportion of the workplace. A relatively heavy burden is placed on plaintiffs terminated in a reduction in force to establish a prima facie case of disparate treatment based on age. The first approach to defining a prima facie case is tailored to the typical situation where an employer claims that performance was a factor in selecting employees for downsizing. 
This approach asks whether any interference of age discrimination can be drawn from a comparison of the ages and relative performance levels of employees terminated with those retained. The second approach is a more general and can be used to analyze situations where, for example, some employees are given the option to transfer and others are not. In downsizing, the question is not why members of the group were discharged or whether they were meeting performance expectations, but whether the employees were selected for inclusion of the list for discharge because of their age. Although employers are free to downsize, they must be prepared to explain why particular individuals were selected for downsizing. Citing a reduction in force by itself is not sufficient to defeat a discrimination claim. In general, it makes both practical and legal sense to offer experienced employees the opportunity to retain employment. Employers should have a clear objective criteria for deciding who to downsize. These criteria must not include age or any other protected class characteristic and should be applied consistently before the fact of termination. The ADEA generally prohibits mandatory retirement. One important exception is for persons who held bona fide executive or high policymaking positions for the two years immediately preceding retirement who reach age 65 and who will receive an annual retirement benefit of at least $44,000 per year. Under the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act, it is legal for employers to offer early retirement incentives to entice workers to leave their jobs sooner than they otherwise might have. However, early retirement incentives cannot be extended to one age group but denied to older employees. Employees must be informed regarding the status of early retirement incentive plans that are under serious consideration. Employers can and should gather information about plan options and engage in discussions at all levels of management without triggering the duty to disclose that an early retirement offer is being considered. However, once the discussion shifts from strategy to implementation and high-level managers become involved in reviewing and approving a specific plan, employees must be informed. Employers that offer early retirement incentives typically want assurance that employees who accept these benefits will not subsequently sue for age discrimination. The Older Workers Benefit Protection Act permits waivers of rights or claims under the ADEA but it establishes stringent conditions for such waivers. Employees must be informed in writing regarding the group of employees covered by the early retirement incentive offer, any eligibility factors for the program, and the time limits applicable to the program. Employees must also be informed of the job titles and ages of all individuals eligible or selected for the program and the ages of all individuals in the same group who are not eligible or selected for the program. In the case of group early retirement offers, employees must be given at least 45 days to consider the offer. Financially struggling companies often file for bankruptcy and are likely to owe wages to their employees and have obligations under benefit programs or labor agreements. Employees are not considered secured creditors. However, some employers file for bankruptcy under Chapter 11 and to continue to operate as they reorganize. The wages and benefits earned following the bankruptcy filing have a high priority claim on the company's resources. These payments are treated as administrative expenses necessary to maintain the viability of the enterprise. Employees have a weaker claim for wages and benefits earned prior to petitions for bankruptcy. These claims have lower priority and are limited to amounts earned within 90 days before the filing of the bankruptcy petition. Non-union employers are generally free to cancel expected raises or bonuses cut wages, or reduce benefits as a means of lowering costs. Employers with unions can approach representatives and attempt to negotiate needed concessions. However, unionized employers cannot unilaterally alter the terms of labor agreements or conveniently ignore them, nor does filing for bankruptcy necessarily absolve the employer of its obligations under a labor agreement.
The bankruptcy code contains a set of procedures that must be followed before bankrupt firms can alter or circumvent labor agreements. Firms must present union representatives with proposals based on the most complete and reliable information available, provide the union with all relevant supporting information, and bargain in good faith. The proposed changes must truly be necessary to allow the company to reorganize. They must treat employees and other parties equitably, and they usually cannot be implemented until the court has approved them. If the union rejects the proposals without good cause, the court may permit the employer to make the desired changes. Employees who involuntarily become unemployed and are able to work, available for work, and actively looking for it are eligible to receive unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance is intended to partially replace lost earnings during periods of unemployment for people who have demonstrated an attachment to the workforce. Unemployment insurance is provided through a combination of federal law, principally the Federal Unemployment Tax Act, and state unemployment insurance laws. The requirement of involuntary unemployment raises many questions. Employees who are laid off or terminated based on business considerations during downsizing are eligible for unemployment insurance. However, an employee is discharged for misconduct might be disqualified. The misconduct usually must be serious and intentional to disqualify an employee from the receipt of unemployment benefits following termination. Employees who quit their jobs are not usually eligible for benefits, but there are exceptions. Courts consider whether a reasonable person would have felt compelled to quit under the circumstances, such as harassment. Employees who leave their jobs because of health hazards might still receive benefits, particularly if they can show that the health problems caused were serious and that their employer was apprised of the situation but did not eliminate the problem. To receive unemployment benefits, the involuntarily unemployed also have to demonstrate an attachment to the workforce, both prior to and following their loss of employment. Part-time employees or those with irregular work histories are often unable to meet these criteria and are denied benefits. Unemployed persons also must show that they're able to work in the sense that they possess the requisite abilities. The unemployed must be willing to seek and accept suitable employment. They are not generally expected to accept employment that is substantially lower paying and less skilled than their usual work. However, unemployed persons who place excessive restrictions on the types of jobs they will accept or the circumstances under which they will work may be deemed unavailable for work and denied benefits. Unemployment benefits generally last up to 26 weeks assuming suitable employment is not located before then. During periods of high unemployment, benefits have usually been extended for additional weeks or months. Unemployment insurance payments are provided through state agencies. Although employers do not have a direct role in administering these benefits, they are required to supply information regarding their former employees. Employers may contest unemployment insurance claims. Solid grounds for contesting claims include evidence that the former employee voluntarily quit, was terminated for misconduct, is receiving other payments, or committed fraud. Unemployment insurance taxes are experience rated. Employers that have less stable employment and produce more claims pay more tax. Employers must provide clear statements of the reasons for termination and supporting evidence to state agencies that decide unemployment insurance claims. Restricted covenants is an umbrella term that refers to a variety of contractual agreements that aim to protect employer interests by limiting the ability of former employees. Some of these limitations include going to work for competitors, disclosing trade secrets or sensitive information, soliciting clients or former coworkers to do business with or join other firms, and making disparaging comments about them. The increasing use of restricted covenants to constrain the activities of former employees raises important legal and public policy questions. Courts consider a number of factors when deciding whether to enforce non-competition agreements and their willingness to do so varies considerably across the states.
Employers whose former employees take actions deemed to violate restricted covenants frequently seek court orders to stop the former employees from competing against them. Non-competition agreements also present interesting questions for prospective employers. It's not uncommon for an employer that wants to hire an employee bound by a non-compete to negotiate a settlement with the former employer. Employers should use non-competition agreements only if important business interests are at stake. These agreements should be crafted to be no more broad than necessary to protect those important business interests. A non-solicitation agreement is another variety of restricted covenant. They restrict former employees from approaching their former employers, customers, clients, or employees. Some courts give employers more leeway in using non-solicitation agreements because they impose a less total restriction on a former employee's actions and ability to earn a living. These agreements are more likely to be upheld where the client relationship is long-standing and the former employee's knowledge of the client rests solely on her work with the former employer. Non-competition agreements often specifically refer to trade secrets and confidential information. But even without these, courts have traditionally recognized a duty of employees under common law not to divulge such information. An employer will be able to successfully justify restraints on former employees to protect trade secrets when the employer has not previously taken sufficient steps to maintain the secrecy of the information. Employers that want to ensure that trade secrets will not be used by former employees must make reasonable efforts to preserve the confidentiality of that information.